Thank you, Doc, and the team for leading us in uh, worship. Uh, this is an exciting week here on campus, and uh, as an alumnus myself, I'm excited when uh, to see so many familiar faces and friends that are coming back, and as uh, the week goes on, we'll have more and more alumni. We have a lot of alumni here already, uh, but especially tomorrow and uh, homecoming on Saturday, it's a special time. Um, if you are an alumnus here, I'd encourage you to stop up on our display table up on the mezzanine, pick up one of the programs, uh, this is specifically for alumni, but students, if you want a kind of a detailed uh, schedule for Saturday homecoming, uh, that is there as well. Uh, but we're excited about that. Uh, for the alumni council members that are here, um, we have our meeting at noon up in the third floor of Jackson Hall in the administrative conference room, so we'll see you at noon. Uh, for all of us students and staff and alumni, uh, tomorrow's a special day. We'll have Ken Rudolph at 9 o'clock again uh, speaking to us. And at 10.30, we have our annual alumni award session where we'll be honoring our alumnus of the year and several outstanding service award winners at that service, so you don't want to miss that. And then uh, if you're an alumnus, at uh, 2 o'clock, we're doing dorm reunions. So uh, go to your uh, dorm that you were in. Uh, between two and four, nothing fancy, just a time to connect with uh, fellow alumni uh, that you're in the dorm with. There'll be some cookies there. Uh, students, go easy on the cookies. Make sure the alumni get theirs first. And then uh, for Johnson City, obviously, when if you're an alumnus in Johnson City, uh, you were not in one of the dorms here in Clark Summit. So we have a special reunion for them at 5 o'clock in the uh, second floor library in Jackson Hall. So that's the Johnson City reunion at 5 and then alumni at 7 o'clock here in the rec center uh, in the back classroom, upper mezzanine, room 209, is our uh, alumni meet and, Greek, uh, meet and greet uh, trivia game and game night hosted by our very own Mike, Mark Myers, who was wearing the Cubs uh, jersey earlier. So we'll see if he's wearing that tomorrow night based on tonight's uh, outcome. But uh, it's great to have the alumni back, and thank you students for uh, welcome, welcoming them back and making them feel uh, special. Uh, it's great to have Mark Stenzi back. Uh, Mark himself is an alumnus, and uh, it's neat to see someone who has given their life to, to one ministry, really. He's been here uh, in Clark Summit area for almost 25 years, uh, both as a student and as a pastor at uh, formerly Temple Baptist Church, now Parker Hill Church, and it's exciting to see what God has done through uh, Mark's uh, humble leadership and through his preaching ministry uh, in Northeast PA. So it's an honor for me as uh, one of the members of his church uh, to hear him, uh, not on a Sunday, but on a Thursday. So, Mark, let's welcome Mark as he comes. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, guys. Good to be back again this morning. David, thank you for leading us in worship. Drew, thank you for sharing a little piece of your story and a lot of your heart in that song that you wrote. Love that song. We've been talking this week about, uh, during this Bible conference, about living in community. So when I was here yesterday, we talked about how essential it is for us to pursue authentic relationships, and that God has never intended for us to go through life and live out our faith in isolation, that we'll never be able to stand strong if we try to stand alone. Now today, I want to talk about the downside of community in a broken world. I want to talk about the downside of relationships in a world where every single one of us has that old sin nature. I want to talk about what happens in our lives and what happens in our hearts when someone disappoints you. Because I believe that some of the deepest pain that we ever feel in life is the pain that we feel when someone we trusted lets us down, when somebody that we love turns away from us or perhaps even betrays us. What do you do when community breaks down? Maybe that person for you is a person who said they loved you and would love you forever, but then not long after that, they left you when someone more attractive came along. Maybe that person in your life is someone who knew you well, someone to whom you had in, divulged your heart and shared things about your life that were very personal, and they not only did not keep those things confidential, they used those things against you. Maybe for you, the hurt and the pain goes all the way back to your childhood because you had a parent or parents who did not love you or protect you the way that a good parent should have. Some of you have been hurt or betrayed by a church or by church leaders, and you've in some ways given up on church and maybe even come close to giving up on God himself. So today, I want to talk about the fact that if you live long enough, you will eventually experience that kind of hurt, that kind of pain, 
that kind of betrayal what do we do when community breaks down and today i want to look at how jesus responded to a, a situation in his life where he could have in his humanness where he could have been wounded deeply so that we can understand what we need to do when someone wounds us deeply a few months ago i came across a very interesting news article about a very interesting museum it's called the museum of broken relationships and this museum is actually a collection of items that had some connection to a failed romance and people would bring these items and donate them to the museum of broken relationships so that they can kind of let go of their past and let go of that connection to an old relationship and so some of the things in this museum are very interesting i'll show you a few uh, there are about a thousand items there on display like this one a frisbee and, and there's a story behind it a stupid frisbee bought in a thrift store was my ex-boyfriend's brilliant idea as a second anniversary gift okay for some of you guys that's right there that's why god wanted you to be in chapel today okay right there just don't buy the frisbee okay i just saved your relationship you are welcome um, an another thing you find in the museum of broken relationships is this garden gnome uh, this garden gnome was given to the museum by a woman whose husband left her for someone else and he she threw that at his car as he was driving out of the driveway for the last time there's a watch there and uh, this watch has a note that came with it it says this the first time my ex told me he loved me he took off my watch and pulled the pin out to mark the time he said it after that I could never bring myself to push it back in or wear it again but had I known then that he was only ever going to steal my time I would have pushed it back in and walked away instead of waiting too many years for my life to start again you hear the pain in that and when I when I read about the museum of broken relationships I thought to myself that's the way that we respond so many times to the pain and disappointment that comes our way from other people we kind of create a museum in our minds and we go back and visit it every so often and we relive it and we love to take other people on a tour of our museum and tell them our sad story and we just reinforce the pain and open up those wounds again and again and again and there are so many people today even christians who get consumed by that pain by that bitterness i'm sure you're familiar with this verse in hebrews chapter 12 it says see to it that no one falls short of the grace of god and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many and in serving as a pastor for years it's been my experience that so much dysfunction and so much unhealth in relationships and in people's hearts can be traced back to hurts that were never deal, dealt with in, in the right way i think a lot of addiction and depression can be traced back to unforgiven hurts i think a lot of marriages fall apart because spouses can't even forgive and move past the smallest injuries i think a lot of kids rebel against their parents and sometimes against other authorities simply because there's some anger and some hurt that's never been dealt with correctly so today i want to talk about how jesus responded to hurt and betrayal so that we know how to respond i'm going to say in these 30 minutes i would boil it down just to this one sentence here's where we're going today when someone does something to you that you don't deserve do something for them that they don't deserve when someone does something to you that you don't deserve do something for them that they don't deserve now before you write that off or push back or mentally check out just just hang with me as we unpack this idea in the next few minutes okay if you have a bible turn to john 13 or bring it up on a bible app john chapter 13 this uh what we're going to read here unfolds on a thursday night the night before jesus was crucified and the context is that that upper room where he had gathered with his disciples for one last meal together but before we get to that let me remind you of what happened on wednesday the day before because on wednesday judas struck a deal to betray jesus to the religious leaders for 30 pieces of silver luke chapter 22 here's how it went down judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray jesus they were delighted and agreed to give him money he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand jesus over to them when no crowd was present see here's why they needed judas it was the passover season 
the city of Jerusalem was, was crowded with people, and Jesus was very, very popular among the people. And so the religious authorities knew that if they tried to arrest Jesus publicly, they might well have an uprising on their hands. And so they needed to figure out how they could find him when he was alone in a quiet place and arrest him there. So they needed somebody on the inside. Judas agreed to be that person. That was Wednesday. Let me pick up the story on Thursday. Jesus had gathered now with his disciples in this private place. They were sharing one last meal together before he would go to the cross. It was the Jewish Passover meal. John 13, verse 2, it says this, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, whenever we imagine this scene, this is how most people imagine it right here. Okay, Da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper. I, I've always thought it was really cool how they all got on one side of the table for the picture. It's like history's first selfie right there. Okay, so erase that image from your mind because it was nothing like that. It looked a little bit more like this because in those days when people had a meal together, they would eat from a table that was 12 to 18 inches off the ground. And you would actually recline, you would actually lie down on a blanket or a mat, you would lean on your left elbow and eat with your right hand. And so this is the way that meals were served and meals were eaten in that day. Now, it's important to understand also that this was a, a formal Jewish meal, and so there are certain protocols to be followed. And so th typically the seating would look like this. I just kind of created this real simple seating chart. So they would be seated around three sides of the table, and the host of the dinner would sit in this position right here. And then on each side of the host, there would be seats for two honored guests. In fact, you might remember a little story where, where the mother of James and John came to Jesus one day, and, and he said, someday in your kingdom, would you allow my two sons to sit in your right and left hand you remember that story and they're like oh mom like so it was traditional that there would be these two seats of honor on each side of the host okay another important detail was that in those days people didn't have their own individual place settings like you would actually share dishes at a meal like this with other people who were sitting around you and so if you were seated in these seats of honor you would have the privilege of sharing uh, those those dishes with the uh, with the host now we wouldn't think of that today as a privilege in our culture they thought of it as a privilege in that culture because it was a sign of trust it's a sign of friendship if you allowed someone else to eat from your dishes uh, it's kind of like uh, you know when you go out to dinner and after dinner the the waiter or the waitress comes and says would you like some dessert and so you say, yeah, I'd like some dessert. And you turn to your wife, let's say, and say, honey, would you like some dessert? And she says, no, I don't want any dessert, but thank you for asking. So you order your dessert, and then your dessert comes, your cheesecake with strawberry topping on it. And you begin to eat it, and your wife begins to eat it with you, and she eats half the cheesecake off of your plate. Totally hypothetical. Are we streaming this? <laughs> totally hypothetical situation. But you're okay with that because this is someone that you love and someone that you trust, so you're okay with them eating off your plate. So in that culture, it would be common at a meal like this that if you were an honored guest, you would eat from the same dishes as, as the host. Okay, so it's very important to keep that scene in mind as we keep reading. So in the middle of the meal, Jesus speaks up, and he makes this shocking announcement. John chapter 13, verse 21 it says, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Now please understand, this would have been a shocking announcement to them. These guys had spent three years together. Three years learning together, traveling together, serving together, working together. They had all these shared memories. They had all these inside jokes they had all these stories about what they had done together in following Jesus. And, and now one of them is going to betray Christ. That wasn't just a betrayal of Jesus. To them, it was a betrayal of trust for the entire group. And so these guys, these guys obviously, they're shocked. Verse 22 says this, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them 
he meant. Matthew's gospel, Matthew says it this way. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. Like, they're looking around and they're saying, is it me? Do do I not know myself that well? Am I the one who's going to betray you? I mean, they had no idea who Jesus was talking about. And I always find it interesting that when you watch a movie about the life of Christ, you can always pick out Judas, right? Like, you can tell, right, up that's Judas right there because he's got, you know, the narrow beady eyes and he's got the disheveled clothing and he's always lurking in the shadows and, you know, never smiles. And you're like, there's Judas right there. That wasn't the case. He didn't stand out. He fit right in. In fact, they made Judas the treasurer for the group. Think about it. Who do you give your money to? Somebody you trust. They had no idea it was Judas, which made the pain of betrayal all the deeper because they never saw it coming because he seemed committed. He seemed like he fit right in when actually he was a pretender. So verse 23, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who, who, who was that referring to, the disciple whom Jesus loved? John, yeah, he wrote this, and he would always refer to himself that way. I just think that's so cool. Like, that's my identity. He loved me, and that's my identity. So one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple. So he's not saying this out loud. He's, He's motioning to this disciple and said, ask him which one he meant, okay? Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And so John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he was reclining next to him, and he leans back against Jesus. So if he's reclining next to him on his left arm, eating with his right hand, leans back against him. Let me go back to the seating chart. So where is John sitting at the meal? He's sitting here, okay? He's sitting in this seat of honor. So he leans back And he says, not loud enough for anybody else to hear. He says, who is it? So Jesus goes on and he answers here. Verse 26, Jesus answered. And and he doesn't answer loud enough for the rest of them to hear. That becomes apparent as you keep reading here. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Keep reading. As soon as Jesus, Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And I love this sentence. And it was night, not just physically but spiritually in the heart of Judas. So a few hours later, Judas would lead the soldiers to the garden where Jesus was, where he would be arrested. Now, here's what's so fascinating to me. If you look carefully at this account, you discover something about how to respond when someone betrays you, when someone hurts you deeply. You discover this truth. When someone does something to you that you don't deserve, do something for them that they don't deserve. Here's why I say that. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, right? In fact, he calls him out on it. What you're about to do, do quickly. I mean, he acknowledges what Judas is about to do. But where does Judas sit at the dinner in the upper room that night? Let me go back to verse 26. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas because bread was like their silverware. He he dipped it and gave it to Judas, the son of Iscariot. So go back to the seating chart. There would be two people who would eat from the same dish as the host. One of them was sitting here. That was John. Who sat there? Judas sat in the seat of honor. So when Jesus that night chose two disciples to have the best seats in the house he chooses john and he chooses judas now here's my question did he know that judas was going to betray him yes he did and yet he gives him the seat of honor now 
There was something else that happened that night as well. And this happened actually before they began to eat the Passover meal. So if you back up in John 13 to verse 5, it says, Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. We're all familiar with this uh, part of the narrative. Um, as you probably know, in that culture, there were no paved roads. There was no asphalt. There was no concrete. Uh, roads were basically dirt trails. When it rained, they became mud trails. Animals used the same roads as people did, which would add an interesting extra element to the mud. People in those days had open-toed footwear, sandals, and so when you arrived somewhere, you really needed to wash your feet, especially if you're going to be sitting down for a meal, reclining on the floor where somebody else's feet are kind of dangerously close to your nose. But there was no servant there that night, apparently, to do the foot washing, because that's who would normally do the foot washing, either, you know, a servant or the youngest child in a household. So Jesus takes it upon himself to wash the feet of his disciples and teach them a profound lesson about servanthood. So here's my question. Here's my question. Did he wash Judas's feet? Yes, he did. See, I don't know if I would have done that. I think I might have skipped him. No, I think I would have washed his feet, and while I had his feet in my hands, I would have broken a couple of toes in the process. Jesus washed the feet of his betrayer. He washed the very feet that would walk to the religious authorities and betray Jesus and walk them to the garden where they could find Jesus. See, when someone does something to you that you don't deserve, do something for them that they don't deserve. But this is not easy, is it? This is tremendously difficult because everything in our culture tells us and everything in our hearts tells us to just get even. When somebody does something to us, we do something back to them even worse. That's, that's the way we naturally operate. It's kind of like um, Angry Birds. One of the most popular digital games ever created, downloaded over a billion times. And for the two of you who never played Angry Birds, um, let me tell you how it works. There's these pigs in Angry Birds, and they steal eggs from these birds. And they take the eggs, and then they run away, and they build these structures. And then the pigs began, begin laughing at the birds, mocking them. So what do the birds do? The birds put themselves in a catapult, and you get to launch the bird to destroy the structures of the pig. But he, here's the question. What happens to the birds in the process? They die. They, they roll around and they blow up. Like, and I've often thought that's, that's pretty much what we tend to do with our hurt and anger. You know, somebody, somebody does something to us. Somebody takes something from us. Somebody hurts us in some way, and we want to damage them. But in the process of damaging them, we destroy ourselves and create bitterness and just corrupt our hearts when someone does something to you that you don't deserve do something for them that they don't deserve because that's the only way to be set free from the bitterness that tends to corrupt our hearts so deeply do you know what jesus was doing in the upper room that night he was actually living out something that he had taught his followers in what we call today the sermon on the mount matthew chapter 5 do you remember these words he said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may become children of your Father in heaven. So I want you to think about something for a minute. Think about that person in your life who is the most difficult to love. That person who has hurt you most deeply. What would it look like to show love to that person that doesn't mean you have to trust them again it doesn't mean you have to allow them back into your life it doesn't mean that you have to continue to have a deep relationship with them it doesn't mean you'll ever forget the hurt that's a myth that you can forgive and forget we don't hopefully though over over time the memory of the hurt fades as we choose to forgive and as we choose to bless that other person but what would it look like to do what jesus says here and to love your enemy Maybe it just begins with what he says here. You just begin by praying for them. And you might have to pray through clenched teeth and clenched fists, at least at first. 
but you begin praying for them and God begins to melt your heart. Maybe it just changes the way that you talk about them so that when their name comes up in conversation, you don't respond every time by saying, well, let me tell you the truth about that person and what they did to me. Maybe it means that you actually choose to perform some act of kindness that's not random because they're your enemy, that you actually choose to love that person in some tangible way. Maybe for you, the enemy in your life is an old friend who deserted you and gossiped about you and just made your life miserable and betrayed you in some way. And you hear by word of mouth, you discover that they've fallen on hard times financially. Maybe loving your enemy means that you send them a check, give them a financial gift. Maybe, maybe the enemy in your life is a coworker who got the credit that you deserved or got a promotion that you should have had. Maybe loving your enemy means that you write them a note of congratulations. Maybe your enemy is that person in the adjoining suite in your dorm who has loud parties until 2 o'clock in the morning so that you can't get enough sleep to get up on time for the class that you have first thing in the morning. That's your enemy in your life right now. Maybe loving your enemy means that you go over there and you vacuum the carpet in their suite for them at 5.30 in the morning. No, I'm just kidding about that part. <laughs> what does it look like to do what Jesus did in the upper room, in the, in, the, in the middle of his deepest betrayal, what does it look like for you, if we're going to be children of our Father in heaven, what does it look like for you to love your enemy? Uh, I, I read a story some years ago from a pastor out in California. His name is Tim Brown. And uh, he, he had a similar situation to this, and I love the way he writes this and describes what happened to him. He says this, some time ago, I was having lunch in McDonald's with my daughter and mother-in-law. We were enjoying a pleasant conversation when a man with his wife and children sat down at a nearby table. The man was someone who in the past had hurt me. We faked pleasantries and exchanged hellos, but I could feel my blood begin to boil at the thought of what he had done to me. This person had wounded me badly, and I was surprised how much hurt I still felt. My family and I gobbled down our food, and on the way out of the restaurant, I overheard, quote-unquote, my enemy and his wife arguing because neither had any money to purchase the food that they had ordered. Their three kids were screaming for their Happy Meals. The couple was embarrassed. My first thought was, praise God, there is justice in this world. He deserves every bit of embarrassment he's feeling, and I'm so glad I got to see this. Suddenly, God spoke to me through the Bible verses I'd read that morning. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, Romans 12. I knew I had a choice to either obey or bask in my bitterness. Somewhat reluctantly, I reached into my wallet, pulled out $20, and gave it to this man who had been my enemy. Have lunch on me, I said with tears in my eyes. What does it look like for you to love your enemy? When community breaks down, when the hurt is deep, when somebody you trusted has betrayed you, when somebody who should have loved you doesn't, how do you respond to that? I love what Vaughn Roberts said. He said this, that when you love people who are like you, that's ordinary. When you love people who are unlike you, that's extraordinary. When you love people who dislike you, that's revolutionary. And see, what we're, what we're talking about today is not ordinary. What's ordinary is to love those who love you back. What's ordinary is when somebody hurts you, you hurt them back. But we as followers of Christ are not called to live ordinary lives. We are called to live revolutionary lives because our hearts and lives have been revolutionized by the gospel and by God's grace. And you might say to yourself, well, Mark, that's easy for you to talk about. But you don't know my situation. You don't know my story. You don't know my hurt, and I don't. And maybe you feel like you don't have the strength to even forgive that person, let alone love that person. And by the way, you, you don't wait and, and, until that person decides to change, until they admit they were wrong. You don't wait until they make some kind of restitution. Forgiveness is a gift that you give, and they choose to do what they want with it. But you say, I don't know if I have the strength to do that. You know where I find the strength to do that? I remember who I am. I'm Judas. 
because in spite of the fact that I grew up in a solid Christian home and went to church every Sunday from the time I was two weeks old and went to a great Bible college, there are times when I betray the one who rescued me from sin. There are times when I turn my back on the Savior who's only loved me and pursue things that are inferior. And yet, despite the fact that I've done something to him and do things to him that he does not deserve, he still gives me something that I don't deserve, which is grace. I love the way it says it in Colossians 1. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusa accusation. See, the, the beautiful message of the gospel is this, that we were God's enemies. But God, by his love, turned us from enemies into his sons and daughters not because of our merit, just because he's a God of grace and a God of love. And I think if you have someone to forgive and you're struggling with that, I, I think this might be the reason why. It might be because I know this is true of me. It, it might be because you're only focusing on what was done to you rather than what was done for you. Because when, when, when we struggle to forgive other people, it's because we've never really understood or we have completely lost sight of what it costs God to forgive us on the cross. And when someone hurts you, when someone wounds you, and you're struggling to forgive them, and you're struggling to love that person who's hard to love, and you're struggling to love your enemy, you know what you do? You just go back to a blood-stained cross, and you stand before that. And remember that when we were God's enemies... He chose to love us in a profound, profound way. So let's stand together. I want to pray with you before you head out. And I just want to pray specifically for whatever it is in your life that you may need to address based on what we've learned here today. And I, I don't know what you're facing in your life, where you come from, where you're going, but maybe just in the next 30 seconds to one minute, just identify in your own heart that person Maybe not a person who's wounded you deeply, but just that person who's hard to love. Who is it that you need to reach out to in some small way, pray for, love, whatever it is today, if we're going to take this seriously, what we've learned today? Just focus on that as I pray for us together. Lord, we thank you for our Savior who not only went to a cross and paid the price for our sin, but even before that cross, he lived a life that models for us what it means to be people of his kingdom. And even in the hours before his death, when he knew he was facing a cross, when he, when he could have been so preoccupied with himself, he focused, he focused on someone like Judas and showed him love and showed him honor and served him and washed his feet, even knowing what he was about to do. But, but that's all of us. Before we were even born, we were in your mind, and you knew that we would betray you, and yet you chose intentionally to honor us by coming into a broken world and going to a Roman cross so that we could be served and forgiven and washed clean. And I pray that we would live in light of that example, in light of that grace for whoever it is in our lives today that's hurt us deeply or even hurt us just mildly, someone that we need to forgive or that person whose path we might cross or that person who might hurt us in the days to come, I pray that you would just give us the impulse, the knee-jerk reaction to love as we have been loved and to forgive as we have been forgiven. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. Great to see you guys again. Have a great day. You're dismissed.